Hello, good afternoon, good evening from Madrid. I'm uh, Juan Arias. And first of all, I'd like to thank Dental Tribune for the possibility of being here and making this uh, different kind of uh, lecture. I'm not used to this kind of lecture. I'm used to having people in front of me, so that way I usually know what we're talking about, what we're doing, and how people feel about this. So this is kind of difficult, different. I've got my, my screens and my things, and I'll just try to talk. And I hope that everything works good and you see uh, good things here that you like. And that's all. I just want to share some cases and talk about the uh, different situations in which we can find the uh, aesthetic problems that we can have in our dental office each day. So uh, let's talk about a little bit about tissue. I love tissue. I like making the aesthetic reconstruction. So we, we're going to talk about all that stuff. And first of all, it's important for me to make people understand that what what, what we try to do every day is we try to make uh, reconstructions, reconstruction of the periodontum, reconstruction of the of the tooth or the teeth that we've lost, and so that's it's important to think that we once we place an implant, we're not just placing the implant, we're placing the implant, we're placing the crown, and it's important that we we find out how to reconstruct the whole periodontum with the tissues all the way with the papillas at the position and with the volume that we really need. Just trying to match everything and see just the same as it was at the beginning when nature started with the, with the work. So it's important to understand that we are, well, what we try to make our final target is to reconstruct the whole periodontal. And so it's important to think about the tissue on one side and on the other side, the uh, hard tissue and the soft tissue, sorry. So we will try to make uh, this lecture divided in how the tissue will can, can, can come and cover some parts of the recession, so create the volume that we need, trying to recreate the nature uh, situation that we have at the beginning. So, first of all, we will talk about soft tissue. And we're gonna talk about the soft tissue rounding the implants and all those cases. But before that, it's, in, it's important to understand how we can uh, manage, how we can obtain that tissue and how we can do it just to cover the recessions. So the first case I'm going to show you, it's a case in which uh, there was a big aesthetic demand, a big aesthetic problem here for the patient. She was, uh, she's a very nice young woman. She's got these recessions that you can see here all the way. Those are big recessions and uh, big amounts of recessions. So usually we try to make two different grafts to cover the recession. When I talk about this case, what I'm trying to explain is how to obtain and how to cover those recessions. And once we understand the way to obtain that tissue, which is much easier, we can do it also with the implants and we will not have any kind of problems doing it with implants. We will integrate that way of working in our daily work with implants so we can gain volume a lot easier. So in this case, we were trying to cover all those recessions on just one uh, surgery. We usually work with uh, conscious sedation so that uh, the patient is like sleeping all the way through the surgery. And at that moment, what we try to make is we try to cover all of them at the same time. So this is the, the, the initial situation. These are the recessions that we had at the beginning. The problem with these recessions is that the, the big amount of recessions that we've got, there are too many teeth with those recessions and the type of recessions are kind of big also it's it, you can see it there in 13 and 23 here you've got a, a, a big uh, length of recession in diameter here it's uh, quite big to introduce there the graft and see how the the, the, the revascularization of the of the graft is going to be so this kind of, of uh, mucogingival surgery can be done with different uh, techniques in 
my opinion, I've been trying a lot of techniques for this kind of recession. I've been trying with alloderm, I've been trying with connective tissue graft, with different procedures with connective tissue graft. And in my opinion, nowadays, the results I'm obtaining with the tuner techniques are quite good. And the way of obtaining those connective tissue grafts are quite good. So I just want to show you how we can try to simplify those kind of cases and to obtain results that are quite good. So you can just see how everything can be easy. That's the ophthalmologic surgery. You can see it here. Let's check. First of all, it's important that you understand when we use this kind of blades, these blades for microsurgery must be as, as small as possible. This blade is 1.25 millimeters, no more than that, which we've got lots of microsurgery blades of this kind, of this type, but the, the important fact of this blade is not just the, the, the length of the, of the blade, it's just how thin it is. See it in this image in which I was trying to show that the, the blade is extremely thin. So with this kind of blade being as thin as this one, you can introduce the blade all the way through the uh, gingival margin being uh, a little bit more uh, precise introducing it and having a lot many problems in which the blade will go all the way through the buccal zone so as thinner as it's possible it's going to be a lot better and it's going to be a lot easier for the surgeon to to deserve the surgery so let's see how the two preparation will go, how it will work. What we do is we introduce the blade. You see the thin I was talking about it. It's very important to make it very thin because these kind of recessions are usually in cases in which we've got a very, very thin periodontum. So it's important to pay a big, a really extreme attention at those moments in which we introducing the blade all that way. Those are very thin tissues and in those ways the, the blade can go out from the from the graft and it's important to pay attention all that way and see here how we are introducing the blade all that way so that the mucogingival uh, line is uh, overexposed it's passed all the way past so that we've got some mobility of the tissue we've got a big mobility of the tissue so there we will introduce the graft and so the the tissue will can cover the graft easily it's important to understand that in this case the blade must be as thin as possible introduce it over the mucogingival line so the tissue will be free and to introduce the graft afterwards and cover it with the graft in not all of the cases we will need to cover it in some cases we can leave it exposed and if we leave it exposed the connective tissue graft will revascularate and finally will be a keratinized tissue so it's good to leave it exposed but if we really want to cover and be sure that we're covering all the recessions it's important to leave it uh, covered if we've got enough keratinized tissue we will leave it covered if we don't have enough we will leave it exposed so all this thing you know, this part of the connective graft that will be exposed will develop in and keratinized tissue. So we go all the way through the recessions over uh, over the mucogingival line until we have something like this in which the uh, flap will be free enough and will be able to move and cover the connective tissue graft with uh, no problem. See how it's completely free and how we can move it. Okay, so in, in I'm going to stop again the video so I can try to explain some more things about these techniques. See how the flap is completely free and the interdental papillas are maintained just at the position that we really want to. We're going to maintain it there. We're not going to uh, rise them. We're going to maintain it. It's a tuna technique. And so the uh, papillas will give a lot of vascularity to the flap which will not be raised, it will just be done a tunnel underneath it. So uh, in my opinion, what I usually use in these kinds of surgery are just two instruments. It's easy with those two instruments, with this papilla instrument and with the 
ophthalmologic plate that you said before, that you saw before. So we, what we do is we introduce the uh, plate all the way, as you've seen in the video before. But in some situations in which is the tissue is so so thin that it we, if we go ahead with it, the problem will be is that it will be exposed all the way through the buccal zone. What we do is we introduce the papilla, uh, the papilla instrument, this one, and that way we will try to rise the flap without having any kind of troubles or, or problems. So I usually use those two uh, instruments. So, once we've done the tunnel, what we do is we use this kind of aluminum paper in which we try to measure the quantity of graft that we need. In this case, the quantity of graft is too big just to obtain one uh, single graft. There's no tissue in the palatal zone in which we can obtain such a big amount of graft. So, what we did in this case is to obtain two grafts and joint join together the two grafts so that we can go all the way through one side to the other side at one uh, only graft. And usually what I've been doing until this moment is I usually use the autothul technique or macrothuller technique in which it was with one single incision to obtain the connective tissue graft. And now they have changed that way and I what I do is I obtained I obtained the connective tissue graft as if it was a free gingival graft. The only difference is once we've got the free gingival graft, what I do is we, I cut all the way the epithelium so that the graft will be free of epithelium and we can introduce it and use it as if, as if it was a graft. The uh, advantages of this kind of technique is that you can obtain as much quantity of connective tissue as you need and it's a lot, it's not that uh, problematic as if it was a, a connective tissue graft because you can see, you can really see how much tissue you're obtaining and it's a lot more secure in my opinion because you know really where you are and the quantity and the the the, the quantity of adiposa tissue it's coming with you you can also select there and just cut the the connective tissue graft that you need i'll i'll trace a video so you can see also how to obtain it so we go with that aluminium paper to the uh, to the palatal zone, we place it there and we just cut it as if it was a free gingival graft, just the same way as there, you can see it in the video. And when it's, it's marked, we take the, the aluminum paper and we remark the incisions. And so we try to introduce the, uh, the blade on a different way. So you can see there how uh, we can manage also the quantity of tissue we're obtaining. See there that there's some uh, adiposa there. You can see the adiposa there. But now we know it, we will go and cut it a little bit thinner so the adiposa will maintain there and we don't sacrifice too much quantity of palatal of the palatal zone. And we place that as sponge so the healing will be a lot better, better there. And so once we've got that uh, free gingival graft, what we only have to do is just to take away all the epithelium on, the, on that side and try to make the way to the connective graft so it will adapt perfectly on the tuna that we've deserved before. So we go ahead and we do just the same. You see there, there's the adiposa that we were obtaining at the beginning. We just cut it out. It's easy. You just have to go very slowly and be sure that you not compromising the, the quantity of graft underneath it, but we will take all the adiposa there and we will do just the same with the other side with the epithelium. We will just go there and take all the epithelium, be very, very, very slowly there because it's important to take all of it outside. You, you will not, you should not leave any epithelium on the connective because it's going to be underneath the flap. So it's important to remove all the epithelium and it's uh, quite uh, difficult to obtain it in just one cut. You can do it in, in more than one, but see how uh, thin the epithelium is, 
is. So we will take it out and we will have uh, a good quantity, a good type of, uh, of free gingival graft, as you can see there, a connective tissue graft is now. There's no epithelium there, but you can see how the, the blade has gone all that way. But we are sure that we've got the quantity and the quality of connective tissue graft that we wanted. If you use the other technique, sometimes you will get too much quantity of adiposa. So once we've got both grafts, we just be sure, you, we need to be absolutely sure that the length of the graft will be enough. We've got there both of them. And what we do is we join it together with just one stitch. As you can see here, this is the stitch. Which, are, which is joining all the tissues, not just one graft, it's two grafts joined together. So once we've got that, what we do is we introduce it with suture from one side of the recessions to the other side. And what we do is with the suture, we go with we also moving it with the papilla instrument. In this case, what we're trying is to move it from one side to the other side until the complete quantity or the, the complete recessions are covered with the connective tissue graft underneath it. There you've got it. It comes from the 14 to the 24. There you've got. And at this moment, what you can see is that there's some connective tissue graft exposed, but it's not going to be exposed afterwards. It will be underneath the tunnel and you'll see it with the suture there, how it goes. It's uh, this kind of suture is the Otto Thulan Marcus Guzzella suture, which goes uh, and gives all the pressure to the contact point, as you can see there. Uh, it goes from the buccal zone to the, to the palatal zone and then goes to the rounding to the contact point is kind of difficult to explain and see it just with the video but you can see it everywhere on, on internet you will see how the that suture goes but the benefit of that suture is that the pressure is going to be at the contact point and the tunnel will, will rise down and the pressure for the graft will be all the way through the periosteum so the vascularity there will be uh, good enough and we will not have any kind of problem so this is once we've finished with the suture, see all the connective tissue graft underneath it, it's covered. So we're trying to cover the whole uh, recessions and we don't need keratinized tissue. In this case, we've got keratinized tissue enough, so we just want to maintain it there. This is how it looks once we've finished and this is how it looks 20 days, uh, 20 days after, after the surgery. That 20 days has nothing to do. It's important to understand that we have to wait for a longer time, wait about six months more or less, and wait and see how the contraction of the tissues will, will go. That usually gets a little bit uh, higher in some positions. As you can see there, there's, some, there's a little bit of recession of residue there, and also you can see some of it there. And afterwards, we will just make the comparison between what we had at the beginning and what we've got six, six months uh, afterwards. It's important to analyze the recessions before we start covering them and see that the most difficult recessions to cover are the recessions of the canines and the central incisor, which are quite white. So the, the tissue will contract and after the contraction it usually gets to some kind of recidiva of those of those recessions. So this is what I just wanted to talk a little bit about tissue and how to obtain those tissue. For me it's been quite uh, important once I've uh, understood that obtaining a free gingival graft and taking out the epithelium will have a real good result. So it was that was very important for me. So that makes everything kind of easier because once we, when, when, when I was trying to obtain the connective tissue graft with one single incision and I did lots and lots of cases just with that, with that technique, it was okay, but you didn't obtain as much quantity as you wanted. And sometimes the quantity of tissue that you obtain was not as regular as you really needed. So sometimes when you finish with those cases, you obtain a big amount of tissue there, which was, uh, you were just hoping it to be contract and, 
and, and get smaller. So with this kind of technique, it's a lot easier because it will, it will just give you the amount of tissue that you really need and you will just uh, be sure that you can change that, that kind of tissue so it, it, it fits quite good in your tunnel technique or in your implant or whatever. So I just want to explain how to obtain it. And now I will try to explain what is my opinion on how to move the tissue in some aesthetic situation. So in my opinion, we've got three different kind of situations. First situation in which the patient comes and what we've got is what we really want to maintain. We've got a tissue position and that position is a position we want to maintain so we will try to preserve it and in other cases what we really want is we want to cover some part of the uh, recession or the length of the of the tooth that we're going to find final with the case or in other case what we try is to make a bigger a longer crown so we will try to make compression so these are the three movements i'm going to talk about and see how we can work with them in, in different cases so the first case i want to show is this one which is uh, it's a man i can i cannot uh, i could not take away all the all, all the the hair he had there in, the, in that picture but he he's got a periodontal problem he's not worried about the aesthetic he's got his aesthetic but his periodontal disease is completely uh, treated and it's everything working quite good no problem about that but in this moment he's got a problem on the premolar on the 25 so in this moment we plain we decided to make the extraction of that 25 but it's a good case for me to explain how we're going to maintain how we're going to maintain the tissue there and we're going to try to make it the way that it won't move so first of all what we did is uh, we, we made this transparent silicone just to be sure that we've got the shape of the premolar the original shape of the premolar that we had so this is the transparent silicone we're going to place there on the, on the Molar. So we've got the shape of the crown. See that the crowns that he's got are quite different and he likes it, he's aesthetic and we don't want to change it. We don't want to place a standard crown in which we won't reproduce those roots. We want to reproduce the root in the provisional and in the uh, final crown. So first of all, we take this kind of impression with the silicone, with the transparent silicone. And afterwards, what we do is we place the implant. We make the instruction. No problem about the extraction, the, the tooth was lost. And we start working with the uh, M system, with the MIS system for the placement of the new B3 implant. Those kind of, of drills will give you a big amount of autogenous bone. If, you, if you're drilling on slower speed, you can obtain a good amount. There you can see the autogenous bone. And then you place the new V3, that implant, which is uh, very good for the stability. It's great stability there and for the maintaining of the bone. So once we place the, the implant, uh, see here the, the V shape, so it will give you a little bit more space there for the gap, so the regeneration and the stability of the tissue will be quite good there, and the conical shape of the implant will give you also stability. So once we place the implant, what we're going to place is this uh, provisional titanium abutment just for the coverage of the implant. So once we place the implant and we cover the implant with the screw of the implant, we will make the regeneration. See here, the regeneration is done with uh, plasma rich and growth factor and bios and autogenous bone obtained from the drilling of the patient. We introduce it there and what we, we, we do there is we cover all the gap. We place the, uh, this abutment, we can place a lot more abutment, the healing abutment, whatever you want, just to protect the implant. But while you are uh, while you are filling the gap or making the regeneration there so once we've done that what we do is we take away take out again the uh, abutment and what we do is we conform a 
rubber thumb. As you can see here, this is a rubber thumb. We just cut it with the shape of the root that we've got underneath it. And what we do is we place the rubber thumb underneath the shoulder of the provisional abutment, of the titanium provisional abutment. There you've got it. So it will protect the regeneration. The regeneration will be here. Okay? This will be the regeneration in the buccal zone, and this is the rubber dam that we've got there. So what we do is we go ahead with the abutment and the rubber dam as we've got there. So it protects the gap and the regeneration that we've got there, and we fill all the emergency profile with composite, with a simple composite. There's no problem about that. Once we place it, when we fill it up, what we do is we polymerize. We shape it, we cover all that, and we polymerize it, and we take it out. And this will be the way it looks. What we've done here is we, we've copied the emergency profile that the patient has. Here it is. Here's the shoulder, here's the buccal zone and the palatal zone, but we've copied the emergency profile that we had at the beginning of the patient. So once we've got there that we polish it, we make the shape and this is how it looks. This would be the buccal zone and the palatal zone and the underneath all of this would be the regeneration and the implant placement on a palatal position. So this is how it matches, this is how, this is how it fits on the extraction that we've done. See that the, the position of the tissue will not be changed, not at all, because the uh, composite is doing the same fu function that we had with the, uh, with the root before. But you can do that for, um, for immediate loading surgeries, and you can also use it for another kind of surgeries. In, in this case, the, this case I'm placing is the, it's a case in which we place those abutments, we fill it up with composite the same day of the surgery. This is the same day of the surgery. We made just the same, but instead of making immediate loading, what we did is we cut it, the titanium abutment, so it's just at the same length that the composite. And we leave it there as if it was a personal personalized healing abutment. This is how it looks four months afterwards, and this is the day of the impression. We will just have to place the impression abutment and fill all the, all, all the root with composite and independence and have an independence copying impression abutment also. So it will be uh, quite easy to reproduce the emergency profile of those roots, even though if we don't make uh, immediate loading surgeries. So this was the case we were talking before. So we've got the silicone transparent silicone key, and what we only have to do is we we uh, put composite all the way, we fill it up with composite, we make a hole here so, the, uh, so there's no problem with the insertion of the screws. So we put the composite and we polymerize it and this will be more or less what we obtain. When I say more or less, I don't mean that this is what we obtain just in the moment in which we extracted. We polish it, we clean it and this is how it looks. But Imagine, in this case, what we've done is we've got in one side, we've got the emergency profile just the same that we had at the beginning of the case with the natural tooth. And in the other side, what we've, what we've done is we've copied the coronal, uh, the, the crown that we had uh, with the natural crown. We copied it. So we've got everything copied. We've got here, as you can see, we've got here, the emergency profile, just the same that he had at, with his premolar, and this crown, this provisional crown, is just the same shape. Here, see how it was at the beginning? It's just the same shape, shape that we've got at the beginning. So this is a composite provisional, and we've done it. We've done it with two very easy steps, no problem about it. And we just leave it there four months. Here you see it four months afterwards and see how everything works four months afterwards and when we've got it, we will just take it out and make just the same procedure for the uh, impression abutment. So we will personalize the impression abutment and also once we've got that, we will 
make this structure try on this is what we're going to see this is the day of the structure try on see how the zirconia abutment adapts perfectly because you can make the uh, impression abutment personalized or you can even scan the premolar that you just uh, created the same day of the surgery, you will scan it, send it to the lab, and the lab will go ahead working with the, the zirconia and the uh, found the final one that you deserve to do. So the adaptation for the zirconia is very good. So at that moment, what we did is we just changed it. Four months afterwards, see here how it looks very nice, and see here the volume that we are going to reproduce the same at the uh, final crown. So this is the final crown that we have that the lab did scanning the provisional uh, tooth that we did before and see how the adaptation of the crown is perfect. There's no ischemia, there's no pressure. It's all just the same that we had at the beginning. So we've copied the uh, the crown that we had at the beginning, not, not only the crown, we've also copied the emergency profile until we finished with the, uh, the perfect crown that will match with the emergency profile. So in this case, we didn't need to place any kind of connective tissue graft because we had enough tissue there. It was not a thin periodontum there. It was a problem with the, uh, it was a periodontal disease problem that was treated and there was no problem with it. The tissue will not raise on a higher position, will keep, will maintain there because the bone is quite near there. We only have to place the implant, but be sure that once we place the implant, make the same shape of the emergency profile so that the tissue will maintain at the same position that we had at the beginning. This other case I'm going to show you is another way of maintaining the uh, emergency profile, another way of maintaining it and copying how we've got from the beginning till the end of the case. We got this situation and it's important to understand that aesthetics is subjective. What means that? It means that if this patient comes to my office as it as it happened, and she says, okay, I've got this situation, and I know I've got a problem in the uh, in the 11 here, and I've got a problem there, but I don't want to change everything. I don't want to place veneers every, everywhere. I don't want to change this. I just want to solve the problem here and make a better solution for this aesthetic situation. But I don't want to change this one. I don't want to change this one, and I don't want to change these other ones. So. In this case, we've got the, the aesthetics absolutely conditioned by the patient, but the aesthetics are subjective. Maybe I don't like it, but she likes it, and if she likes it like that, I'll try to maintain it just the same as she's got. So there was a problem there, so we did have to make the extraction, and we did the extraction, and we just uh, placed the implant there as it's usual, we place the implant, we place the healing abutment, and we make the hard and the soft tissue regeneration. Hard tissue regeneration was made with uh, bios and autogenous bone with PRP, with plasma rich in bone factor, and we filled up the gap with all those tissues. And afterwards, what we did is we placed a connective tissue graft, which was coming from the tuberosity. The characteristics of this tissue is different from that. Connective tissue graft, a common connective tissue graft from the palatal zone. The tuberosity tissue will be a tissue that will maintain a lot more the volume. So if we place it there, we will see that the volume even get a lot bigger in some months. So it's good to maintain volume. Volume, the best way of maintaining the volume is with the tuberosity tissue. So we placed up that, uh, that tissue and see how it looks from the occlusal zone. This looks quite good. We're just filling the gap. We're placing some volume there so the tissue will not uh, collapse. And the problem now is how to maintain the aesthetic that the patient was saying that she doesn't want to mean she doesn't want to change, she just wants to maintain it. So what we did in this case is we used 
her a natural chrome, just emptying it. We empty all of it, we empty all the chrome, going very, very slowly with a lot of water so the, the tooth will, will maintain the structure, but we empty all of it until we've got a space enough there to place the provisional abutment underneath it so the crown will be just the same that we had at the beginning. But it's important to understand that we need to leave about two or three millimeters here of, of diameter of the tooth, of the natural tooth, so it won't bro broke. This is very thin and it will break if not. So it's important to leave about three millimeters, leave it there. If not, it will break. So go very slowly with a lot of water and that will be good and you will have no problems about that. So we use the natural crown and we place it on the same position that we had at the beginning, but in a little bit uh, upper position. We go, we place it a little bit more uh, coronal. Okay, so there you can see the, the graft underneath it, and this is the provisional crown, which is her natural crown that she had at the beginning. This is the lateral way, how you can, how you can see it. This was the initial situation, and this is how it looks four months afterwards. It looks quite good. The tissues are very nice there. The healing there are very, very good. We're just copying the same shape shape that we've got in the other one. In this case, we did introduce the connective tissue graft because I was scared of some kind of recession and I did want it to cover this small uh, recession that we've got at the beginning. See how everything changed and everything looks just, uh, just, uh, just the same. Okay, so this is how it looks for months afterwards. The problem starts now. The problem means when we have to change that crown because everything is just the same that we had at the beginning and the patient has no problem with aesthetics. She's very comfortable with that aesthetics. What she wants is to uh, have the final crowns which will look uh, as much as possible at uh, that provisional crown. So, what we did is these uh, two veneers, these are the lateral veneer, the central veneer, and this is the zirconia abutment, which will have some uh, porcelain all over it. So we will uh, cement this veneer into this abutment, and we will cement the veneer, the lateral veneer, to the lateral. So the colors of the cement will be just the same and we will not have any kind of problem there. See the veneers are very, very nice, very, very elder veneers. They look like if they were elder. So once we place it, the aesthetic will be just more or less the same. So this is three years afterwards. See the volume of the tissue. I was talking about the tuberosity tissue is maintaining perfectly there. And see the aesthetics three years afterwards, we're trying to maintain the aesthetic. Remember, we're trying to maintain the aesthetic that the patient had at the beginning. We place this veneer, very nice veneer, and this veneer overcoming the implant that we've got uh, underneath it. Okay, so that was the two cases I was talking about uh, maintaining the position that we had at the beginning, the natural position, we don't want to change, we just want to maintain it. And now we're going to talk about decompression, what we can obtain with the decompression. With decompression, what we do is we leave space. And if we leave space, the tissue will come with us. So it's important to understand that if we leave space, the tissue will come. And if we uh, make pressure, if we don't leave space, we pressure the tissue, the tissue will try to find a space on the laterals. So the gingival festum will grow, will get higher and bigger. So that will be the explanation for compression. Decompression means space. And with the space, the tissue will come to a, a coronal position. Okay, so let's see this case. This is a young woman, she's got a an implant there on the central incisor and she came to her office with this situation but what happened in this case is that there was a very small uh, bone uh, problem there rounding the implant it was a 
pre-implant tissue that was lost there, but it was not more than two or three millimeters. But the problem is that she went to her dentist with this situation, and his dent well, her dentist, what he said is that, okay, we will make a heart tissue regeneration surgery there. And the problem is that they placed the heart tissue graft there, and the, the tissues were absolutely necrosed. And after that, one or two months after that surgery, this is what we obtained. This is what uh, she or the patient obtained when she came to uh, to see us. There was no papilla there. There was a, a big aesthetic problem there. And she was absolutely upset with the situation, even though she was very, very scared of what treatment we had to, we had to make at that at that point. So we talked with her and we told her, okay, the best thing here is to make the extraction of the implant and see what happened with that, with that lateral, but it doesn't look very good. And when we talked with her and we told all, all her, all those things to her, what she said is, okay, just try to make whatever you want, but don't make the extraction of the implant. And when I saw the x-ray, uh, the problem is that we don't have here the x-ray, but when we saw the x-ray, it was real that we didn't have that much quantity of hard tissue lost there. There was a very long implant that was placed on the nasal zone also. So when she said that we did, we, that we are not going to make the extraction, uh, we decided, okay, we will try to make different different treatments and see what is the final result. We will see what happens at the ending. But there was no possibility for making the extraction. She didn't want to. And the other question what was, what was going to happen with that lateral incisor? See the lateral view and see the hole that she's got there. Okay, so we started talking with her and we told her that we will start with the ortho treatment and trying to move that lateral incisor to a lower zone. See here to a to a coronal position. We were making the extrusion of the lateral incisor. The lateral wasn't looking quite good at the beginning, but after the extrusion, we were quite scared of what was going to happen after the extrusion. So we were talking with her and saying maybe we have to make the extraction of the lateral. We'll see once we finish with the with the case. So we were. Working with the uh, ortho treatment until this moment in which we saw that the pressure here of the crumb to the tissue was quite big. So what we did is we removed that crown and we placed the first provisional there, which were, we were trying to leave space from the crown to the, to the tissue. So that space will be filled, as you can see here, will be filled with the tissue because of the extrusion and because of the space. So this is what we ended once we finished with the ortho treatment. But it's important to see that in all this, in, in all this case until this moment, we didn't have done any kind of surgery, just orthodontic treatment and leaving space for the tissue to come down. So once we finish at this situation, what we did is the first surgery in which we follow up the DSD of the patient and we made some uh, crown length uh, surgery. We were trying to improve the length of those, of those teeth so we can match it with the uh, canines here and with the defect that we had there. And once we did that, what we also did is a uh, tuberosity tissue graft all the way through the buccal zone of that implant that we, that we had. So we will try to gain some more volume. This is the suture and this is how it looks uh, 10 days after the surgery. Looks quite good. The emergency profile looks good. And we know that we don't have papilla here, nothing to do with this papilla. But the tissue, the position of the tissue is quite much better than we had at the beginning. So once we were there, we started with the aesthetic final treatment. We prepared veneers for uh, 21 and 12 and the uh, final crown for the implant that we had in 11. Those are the provisional we deserve. And this is the crown and the veneers we had there. The healing. The abandonment, the circonia abandonment we had, 
and the final placement of the veneers and the prom. And I know it's not a perfect final ending of the treatment of the case, because if you analyze it, you will see that there's no papilla that has nothing to do with this papilla. And this one. And we know it's not good enough. It would be a lot better if we have done the extraction. But for the patient, it's important to understand that the patient sometimes marks the evolution of the treatment. Even though we will try to get the best result with the treatment that we will deserve, but it's a treatment in which we only made some orthodontic treatment and very small surgery treatment. And sometimes when we get to this point, it's, it's important to review the pictures that we had at the beginning and see where we started with the case and see where we finally ending. So, once we get there, it's important to see how the patient feels like with the result. In this case, she was very happy with that and she didn't want to change anything. So we just maintained that case. Just, it's important to remark that this case was done because of giving space so the tissue would come down. This other case of decompression is a case of a severe periodontal problem in which we finally decided to make the extraction of those of those teeth and place and implants there. So the patient was really happy to change the aesthetics. She didn't want to maintain that aesthetic situation. And because of the periodontal problem, we decided to make the extraction, which was a lot better for long term. We thought that the result was, was going to be better from the long, long term, and we did the the extraction and the implant placement. So we made the extraction, there was no problem about that. The until the seal was a problem there. And we used in this case the uh, M-Guide system from MIS, which is a very, very nice system to work with, very, very impressive with the, with the final results because what we can do there, we can work with the M-Guide system and the M-Lab. So the M-Lab will give you the provision and everything will be fixed and you just have to have to place it. It's very, very nice to work with it because you've got the perfect position of the implant, the perfect 3D position. There's no flap there. The healing is a lot better. So it's important to try different systems. And I recommend this, this system because it's very, very precise. So these are the uh, provisions that the M lab deserved and the M guide here. The provisions and we just have to work with this drilling you've got the length the position there's no uh, way of thinking you just prepared everything with the stl files you just made the surgery on the computer and you just go ahead with the drilling you just place the implant on the position that you prepared uh, at the beginning so uh, no, no no problem about the placement no problem about the position everything just prepare from the beginning. So those are the V3 implants again that will give you enough stability. It's very important to think that in those cases in which we're going to make immediate loading, the stability of the implant must, must be as good as possible because that stability will give you the possibility to make the immediate loading. And if you're not, you don't have the possibility to do it, you will have a problem there. So we place this uh, abutments for the uh, for the provisionals we place the abutment that will go to the implant these are the multi-unit abutment of MIS and once we place them what we do is we place the uh, the hard tissue and the soft tissue grafts there in this case we've got a thick periodontum rounding the implants the 11 21 we've got thick periodontum but the problem is going to be the 12 and the 22 so we make the hard tissue regeneration with the prp bios and autogenous bone we introduce it all that way and once we've got that what we do is we place also a connective tissue graft long enough to cover from the buccal to the palatal zone so we will cover all the emergency profile of the uh, all the emergency profile of the uh, 12 of the 22 in 
this case. And we do just the same with the trough. We place the uh, BIOS, the autogenous bone, the PRP, and we cover all of it with the connective tissue graft so that those pontics, the 12 and 22, will be a lot more covered because if not, the contraction of the tissue will be quite good, quite big there. And in the gap of the implants will be just the BIOS and the PRP they're placed, just as if it was a, a normal case. You've got a thick periodontum, so you don't have problem there. So this is how it looks, and these are the provisionals. Adaptation of the provisionals, we place the provisionals there, just the way we place the provisional, and this is how it looks. Once the, we finish with the case, the, finish with the surgery, the suture there, and the adaptation of the provisions. This is the way it looks with video, which is more or less the same, and 10 days afterwards, the healing and the volume that we obtain is good, but nothing to do, it's just 10 days. We have to see how it works with some months afterwards and see how the contraction works. One month afterwards, see this line, this line is the line that usually happens when you place a connective tissue graft underneath it and once you start with the pressure with the pontic there, the tissue will go to a, an upper position and you will see that line, okay? So one month afterwards, we still wait until four months in which we change those provisionals. We change the first provisionals and we see the emergency profile, the uh, gingival festoon that we've got there and so we change it for we place a second provision second provision that will try to change again the shape we will try to reshape the tissue and so find a way in which the papilla will come with us and we will try to cover all those spaces we're trying to uh, obtain some more papilla here and to cover this and see how it develops. This is one month after the second provisional there. The tissue is covered. And so we removed those provisionals and we placed the uh, final cones. This is the emergency profile we obtained once we removed it. And this is the final crumbs that we preserved. So what it's interesting about this case is about how the tissue will change with the pressure. See, once we place the final uh, crumbs, I talk with the lab and they say, okay, I need some more space here so the tissue will come with us. Okay, and I also need some more space here. And at the final crumbs, they did that. They give me this space and this space. And I was kind of scared and see how everything will look after some time with that. And we thought that maybe we should finally change the, those final crumbs, giving not that much space. But I was wondering if this tissue will cover all of it and see how everything will develop. This is once we place those final crumbs and this is no, uh, the lateral view, see, it's just more the same that we saw at the beginning. And this is how it looks, just trust me, 10 minutes after the placement of those final crowns. See how the tissue has changed there and also there. And see how it looked at the beginning, once we place that. See it here. This is when we place the crowns, and this is 10 minutes, just 10 minutes afterwards. And in the lateral, it looks more or less the same. And this is two months afterwards. All the space that we had at the beginning was completely covered. And compare what happened. This is the lateral view. We've got enough volume there in the laterals. No problem. We've got good grafts. And this is how it looks with the video. But see the comparison between once we placed it the same day, we left a space and that space changed two months afterwards in the complete coverage. You don't need to wait two months. In one week, you have, you have it completely covered, but wait two months for the stability of the, of the tissue. And this is the comparison between what we had at the beginning and what we had uh, once we, we finished with the case. Okay. 
initial and final situation. Okay, tissue compression. What we will gain with tissue compression, with just uh, uh, the absolutely different that we will have with the decompression, with the compression, with the decompression. Sorry, with the compression, the tissue will come down with us, will come to an, a corner position. With the compression, we will reshape the tissue so that the tissue will re will move just to create a new emergency profile. We will guide the tissue to the papillas, to the lateral zone, or we will go it to, we will guide it to an apical position. So we will try to change it with the compression, we can change it perfectly. So let's see uh, the, the secret of this, uh, of this kind of treatment with the decompression, the same as decompression, is the provisional. If we use the provisional crowns, we could change the, the position of the tissue no matter what kind of uh, provisional you use. It's important to make the compression in the position that you really want it so that the tissue will rise just to the lateral zones and will recreate the uh, gingival test. Okay, so this is a case in which we have, we have finished completely with the surgery. Everything is done there. The implant is placed. The soft tissues are also recreated, are uh, regenerated there. And so we place the healing abutment. And once we place the healing abutment, what we do is we uh, start making the first provisional. The first provisional is a provisional which will not produce any kind of pressure, it's just going to cover the aesthetics, it will just be placed there and we will leave the healing of the tissue and afterwards we will start with the pressure, okay? So this is two weeks afterwards, after the placement of the provisional and see here, you can see how uh, we can see the first line of uh, resin, which we're starting to make pressure, you can see the tissue, how it's getting with that ischemia, it's getting white, so that's pressure. So we leave it around two weeks, more or less, until we do it again. We reproduce that, that pressure, we do it again, and see here is the new pressure there, all the tissues with ischemia there. So we're trying to copy the emergency profile that we've got on 22. Okay, so once we finish with that, two weeks afterwards, we will just try to remove that provisional and just copy the emergency profile and with that we will do the final crown. But see with pressure how we can change and recreate papilla. Here we had no papilla, we had very uh, straight lines of tissue and here we got the gingival festoon that we did deserve. So it's just because of the pressure, with the pressure and with tissue. It's important to understand that if we don't have tissue there, hard and soft tissue there, we will not be able to make any kind of pressure. But if we've got tissue and we, gain, we make pressure, the tissue will come wherever we really want to. So we, just, we will have to copy the provisional and create the final crown. So let's see these two uh, last cases. This is a case in which we, uh, we've got an internal resorption of the, of the root there on 11. So we had to make the extraction, but the, the tooth was quite nice there. So we tried to uh, make a mark, a line in which we knew where the position of the provisional crown will be. We're going to use the natural crown of the patient for the placement of the provisional, but it's important to understand that you need to place it on the exact position that you had at the beginning if you don't want to change anything. So we make the extraction, maintaining the line, no problem about it. So once we've got the, uh, the extraction done, what we do is we place the implant Again, we go slowly with the drilling so we can obtain the, uh, the autogenous bone and we place the implant on a palatal zone, that's the V3 implant, it's a 5 mm diameter implant that will reduce to a 3.9 implant, so that's good because there will not be any kind of pressure to, to the problematic zone. See, he, see here how the V is seen how you can leave it on the buccal zone space for the uh, 
hard tissue grafts underneath it. So the stability is good, there's no problem, we can make the immediate loading and we again make the hard tissue regeneration with PRP and in this case PUROS. We place it all the way underneath the, uh, the gap that we had. And once we did that, what we did is just the same with the uh, provisional crown. We reproduced the emergency profile of the patient and we placed the natural crown of the patient as the, lined, as the lines said, as we copied the lines at the beginning of the case. So we will place it just at the same position that we had at the beginning. Okay, once we've got that, once we've got the provisional, we go ahead with the connective tissue graft. We will be just the same that we've been talking before. This is a free connective tissue graft without the epithelium. So we introduce it all the way through the buccal zone. So it will give us volume and there will, no, will be no risk for recession or aesthetic problem for the implant. So we introduce it all that way and it will look more or less like this. And so we place the provisional crown, which is the natural provisional crown of the patient that will maintain the pressure. There's no pressure now. It's just maintaining that position that we had. Maintaining the position, no pressure, just giving a stability for the grafts underneath it. And we wait, see the adaptation of the crown the suture at the ending, and this is 10 days afterwards. We've got big amount of volume there, see it, but we know that that volume will get contracted. There's no problem about it. 10 days afterwards, we remove the stitches, and this is how it looks three months. So three months afterwards, we are ready for the uh, final restorations. So it's important to make a new DSD and see the length of the crowns that we've got. So we transfer the length of those crowns to the uh, position that we've got now. And in this case, what we did have to make is we removed, we made a surgery in which we were trying to increase the length as the DSD said. But we did the surgery for all the teeth, but not for the implant because the implant, what we were trying to change is the, uh, the, the length. We will try to change it with pressure as we've been talking before, okay? So we did the surgery, as you can see there, we just removed the tissue with the length that we obtained from the DSD, trying to reproduce an adequate gingival festum. in all the teeth but not to the implant it's important the implant will maintain the position and we will change the length with pressure so we remove we remove all that tissue until it gets more or less like this well first of all we also uh, change the length of the of the hard tissue underneath the bone we model the bone until it gets three millimeters underneath the soft tissue. So it looks more or less like this once we finish with the surgery that day. And after the healing, it looks like this. Now the implant has got a small uh, length. So we will start working with the implant after the composite. What we do is just more or less the same. What we do is we measure where we want the position here you've got the position of the 22 of the 21 we just copy it to make it just the same as the other one so we've got tissue more we've got a big enough tissue there so we can remove it with the blade first of all we remove it with the blade and once we remove it with the blade what we'll do is we shape it We take it out and what we do is reshape it with a lot of water with uh, with making just the same uh, shape that we've got in 22 and we remove the provisional also and 
we will try to polish it all the way also here we will try to polish there with a lot of water just to making the same shape that we've got in the other one very slowly very 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 kindly there so we, we don't remove something that we don't want to remove and after that what we do is we uh, reshape the provisional so we will have enough uh, pressure for the tissue that will maintain the position that we just uh, give, gave it. So that's the introduction of the uh, provisional crown. Copying just the same emergency profile that we've got in the other one. This emergency profile must be more or less the same than the other one. The length is going to be the same for sure, but the shape of the emergency profile it's also going to be the same. So this changes is not only pressure, we have changed it, but see how the pressure of this tissue collapses when we remove the uh, provisional because all the tissue is maintained because of the position of the provisional. Once we remove it, as you're going to see here, it will collapse and it will change. So it's important to understand see it there. It's important to understand that once we place the final crown, the final crown must have just the same uh, status, shape, emergency profile that we've got on the provisional we deserve. So the provisionals are everything. With the provisionals we can change the emergency profiles and once we have it, it's important that we just have to copy it. Okay. And this is the last case I, I'm going to show you. This is uh, another periodontal patient with a big aesthetic problem, as you can see there. Uh, the evolution of the periodontal disease is quite big, and she's got that problem in which he, he aesthetically doesn't like anything. He can't even talk. When he talks, the, the, he spots, so he wants to change as much as possible there, and we've decided to remove those uh, those tooth so we make the extraction there with a differentiation that we placed instead of two implants on central incisors what we did in this case is we placed uh, what we did is we placed four implants we did have enough space there it's important to measure the space we've got there but in that case we did have enough space for the four implants placement. I'm, don't, I'm not saying that in the cases in which we remove the four incisors, we should always put four implants. As I told you, it's important to uh, measure. And if you've got space enough, you can place the four implants with the benefit that with four implants, you can uh, play with the tissues independently. So each implant will have one provisional so the provisional will work just by himself, no pointing. So it's a lot easier to work that way and the results will get a lot better. And in this case in which we did have a lot of space, we didn't expect it to have papilla and laterals and we finally didn't uh, rise that papilla, but we did have space enough to play with the tissue and anyway obtain as much papilla as we, as we could. So, this is the way it looks once the four implants are placed and there was no problem. It was a, a thick periodontum tissue there, as you can see. So we only placed the, the hard tissue grafts so uh, we can uh, fill the gap we have there. Okay, so we did just the same on the four implants and we placed these peak abutments, those provisional plastic abutments. And at the first moment in that surgery, we just placed uh, uh, the four provisions were together. In this case, we just were expecting for the uh, for the osteointegration of the implant. So we didn't make any kind of individual provisions. We waited for some months afterwards. This is the uh, final of the surgery, and this is how it looks. The papilla about four months after the surgery. We didn't work with the papilla, not at all, not at this moment. We're going to start working now, okay? The papilla has nothing to do with what we can obtain at the ending if we start working.
with it. So the implants are also integrated at this moment. So we will take some impression, normal impressions, and we will place the second provisionals. Those provisionals are going to be independent, and with dependence, and with the independence of those provisionals, we can start working with the tissue a lot better. So this is how it looks after. Uh, no, in the same day we placed it, we changed also the length of the canines there. As you can see, the length of the uh, of the 13 is going to be changed because we are going to finish the case with uh, veneers there. So we uh, make uh, increasing surgery for the, for the crown and this is how it looks once we made that surgery and we placed the provisions. Two months afterwards, two months after the healing and after the working with the tissue, see the papilla there looks much better than what we had at the beginning. And we don't have papilla in the laterals, but we are expecting to have some something here is growing, as you can see. Not quite big, but something is coming a lot better than what we had at the beginning. See the papilla? That is a nice picture I really like because you can see very Worldly described the papilla on the call here in the book and the palatal zone there. And that's the volume we obtain at the ending. So once we've got the tissue where we really want it, we just made the final impression with the veneers for the canines there and decompose it there, the individualizing, personalizing the abutments and maintaining the tissue there. See the papilla here, how it's very goodly maintained with the composite. Those are uh, the moment in which we started with the impressions and the preps for the uh, veneers for the canines. These are the provisionals. And this is the zirconia uh, fion, the zirconia structure, and the moment in which we placed the uh, veneers and the final crowns. This is the lateral view of the final crowns and the uh, frontal view of the final crowns and the final veneers of the canines. And the comparison we've got from the beginning of the case till the ending. We know that we don't have papilla here in the laterals. We know it, we, we know it from the beginning, but we obtain some kind of papilla during the the central incisors and we will see how everything develops but it's important to think the things that we the things that we can obtain with the provision so i'm now gonna leave you with this uh, small video with the different cases i'm sorry that we don't have audio but it's uh, just a small summary of the cases that i've placed and once we Finish with that, I'll try to see the questions and answers, and we'll talk about that.
Okay, there's uh, a question here which says that where can I get this kind of plate? Uh, I don't really know the name now, but uh, I will try to uh, find out the, the, the place where you can buy it and the, the reference and uh, I'll try to send it to Dental Tribune. I'm, I'm sure that Dental Tribune will just share it. And maybe if not, I will try to show it on, on Facebook, the reference and everything, so you will see it. Uh, great pictures, thank you a lot. <laughs> Brazil. When the MIS and the Great V3 implant will arrive in Brazil, I think that's nothing that I can do with that. I think that MIS can answer a lot better that. What, it, what age did the patient get your implant? What age did the, this patient get your implant? I don't know which patient you're talking about. Did you replace the old long and with new, oh, 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 I think that you're talking about the age the patient took the implant, the one that there was the defect on the buccal zone. I don't know what age she had the implant, but I, I don't know there was a problem with the implant because when she arrived to me, she was about 50 years and, and maybe about 10 years before, something like that. But there was no problem with the age, it was just a problem that there was some hard tissue rounding the implant and there was a problem with that hard tissue there and she just lost some bone and the dentist decided to make the regeneration and those cases are quite difficult to obtain regeneration there even though a lot worse when the uh, when the uh, crown is being maintained so I don't think the problem was the age did you replace the old long implant with new one? No, I said uh, when I was talking about that case, we didn't change the implant. We maintained the implant. Uh, that was one thing that the implant that the patient said she was not wanted to wanting to make any kind of change with the implant, and the implant was good enough to maintain it. If I did have seen any kind of problem with an implant, I would just make the extraction. But I didn't make the extraction because the implant was good. There was just some tissue lost surrounding the implant. But I think that maybe a big amount of implants that has that uh, bone lost surrounding it. So no problem about it. Thanks. Thanks. It was very interesting. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thanks. Felicitaciones, doctor. Gracias por compartir un poco su conocimiento con nosotros. Thanks a lot again. Is it dangerous to open a soft tissue gap? Where is it? Is it dangerous to open a soft tissue gap? Where can go through food and to have risk of implantitis when you want soft tissue to go down? Well. Uh, you don't usually leave that much space. Well, you leave space, but not for big parts of food. There's no problem about that. The thing is that uh, the tissue wants to come to its natural position. You know, so if you leave some space little by little, you don't leave a big amount of space. If you leave some space little by little, the tissue will come with us. So it's not that dangerous. It's not a problem about that. If the, pro if the implant is okay and the patient has a good hygiene technique, that will not be any kind of problem. But you, it's important that you're going to leave little by little, not a big amount, just little by little you will try to cover it and you will not have any problem with that. So uh, I think these are all the questions, uh, lots of things about thanks, have a nice day, it was very interesting. Thank you all very much, it's my honor to be here, thanks to Dental Tribune, thanks to MIS and hope you enjoyed it and have a good, good evening, have a good night, thank you very much.
We would like to thank our speaker for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us today. We would also like to thank our sponsor for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The CE quiz is now available online on the course page and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Thank you again, take care and goodbye. Oh,